Good morning. Good morning. I am not Lisa Fagerstrom. I am almost as good looking, funny, and gregarious. I am, what's that? Oh, okay. Um, I am Meg Rivers Wright, and I am your parish administrator and coordinator of membership. And Lisa's not feeling well today, so I'm stepping in. Uh, good morning. <laughs> welcome to the First Parish Church of Stowe and Acton, a welcoming and spiritual community. For those visiting FPC for the first time, we welcome you. Please let us know you were here by filling out one of the visitor information cards in the pews and hand it to an usher, or drop it in the plate, or hand it to me and I'll be seated at the back. Our minister, staff, and board are listed on the front of the order of service. Feel free to ask me or any of these people more information. If you would like a large print order of service or hymnal or an assisted listening device, which is just a little radio, uh, please ask one of our ushers. Anyone is welcome to use one of the radios to listen to the service from another space in or around the building. After the service, please join us for coffee and conversation in our fellowship hall, which is one level down at the other end of our building, through that door, or in a breakout room if you're joining us online. I'd like to draw, I was going to say I'd like to draw your attention to the announcements in our order of service, but I think the wizard who designs the order of service does a pretty good job designing it so that they stand out anyway. Um, however, I do have an announcement uh, from Ellen and Rick who say, join us for some weeding after church today.
Gloves and tools are available. Even 20 minutes can help. And our minister has a couple announcements. You see that a lot of our choir has taken the morning off today, and that's because we have a really special service this evening slash afternoon, depending on how you define things, at 5 p.m. here in the sanctuary. We're doing a special Equinox Peace service, which is going to be chock full of choir music and soloists and it premiering a new piece, which Chris wrote. It's going to be really beautiful, so come on back 5 p.m. tonight. Um, this is going to be a lot like our Christmas slash solstice vespers, but for the autumn equinox. Um, also, it, for those who are joining us online, my apologies. I feel like I've been neglecting to give you information about services lately. Today we're featuring an apple communion. So if you have a piece of fruit in your place where you are worshiping, please go grab one during one of the hymns or during one of the quieter moments and have it ready if you can, or if not, just hold a fruit in your mind's eye. All right, well, I think we're good. <laughs> um, if you check out our webpage, You'll find more information about us in general, and you can also sign up there for our newsletter and email events and alerts. And now let us come together for a time of community singing and worship. Thought I might explain a little bit what I'm doing up here singing. Um, Trevor and I were talking last week about music for today, and the subject of leader came up. And Lieder is a form of German art song um, where the pianist and the singer have equal parts and they both work to tell the story. Um, and Trevor mentioned Schubert's Winterreise, which is a song cycle, which is a set of 24 songs that he wrote towards the end of his life. Some think he knew he was dying when he wrote them. Um, and. It's about a, the, the whole song cycle is about a traveler who doesn't seem to have a home, who's lived through troubles, who's dealing with mental illness, um, making his way through the world. Um, and it's a journey into winter. Um, so as we start the beginning of fall, we begin our own journey into winter time. Um, it's a rather depressing song cycle if you look at the translations. <laughs> We thought we'd, I thought we'd ameliorate that a little bit by doing it in reverse order. So the things will get progressively happier. Although if you look at the, the anthem, it's not all that happy. Um, this song is about, the song I'll sing next, Decrea, is about a crow who is following our wanderer. Oh, uh -huh. 
Das, war's, das war sehr gut, ja? <lacht> Vielen Dank. Our opening words are autumnal welcoming from Sarah Getty McNeil. And then our chalice will be lit by Eve this morning. Come in from the crisp air, morning air outside. Come in wearing the autumn sunlight on your face. Come carrying the turning of the seasons of your heart. Whatever and however the greatness of life is speaking to you now, you are welcome here in our circle of friends. Eve, come on up and we'll light the chalice with these words. Our flaming chalice, the symbol of Unitarian Universalism, is the balance of the cup and the flame, the water and the fire. And we light it today for Mabin, the autumn equinox, a time of balancing when the sun is directly over the equator, not above it or below it in the turning of the year. Our opening hymn is number 51. This is Lady of the Season's Laughter. And I don't know if you know it that well, but I love this hymn. It was originally written to a much more Germanic kind of tune, um, but it's to this lovely lilting tune now. And it was written by Kendall Gibbons, who was my worship professor in seminary. So please stand and enjoy, in body or in spirit, Lady of the Season's Laughter.
and please join in our covenant and affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. We acknowledge that we are on the unceded territories of the Massachusetts, Nipmuc, Pawtucket, and Wampanoag peoples, as well as honoring and recognizing the black and African people whose unpaid and forced labor built this country and our state. We celebrate and work in solidarity with black, indigenous, and people of color organizations leading the movement for our collective liberation in line with our UU values. Thank you, Meg. So this is the first day of our religious education classes for this program year. And as such, we want to take some time to honor our teachers as they begin this important work. I'm a product of Unitarian Universalist religious education. How many other people in this church is that true for? A handful, a good handful, yeah. And uh, what that tells you is a lot of people come into Unitarian Universalism as adults and so don't really often know what our religious education programming is like. But one of the things I value about it so much is that we're raising free thinkers and we're raising kids full of exploration. And what I learned from Rayla last week at our teacher training is that Rayla brings a real attitude of that this is not a time when you have to get through the program and cover the bases in the curriculum, but this is a time when we shape what we're doing to meet the needs of the children who are here and present with us. And our teachers are trained to do that in really wonderful ways, and we couldn't do this work without them, and it's so vital to the future of this church. And with that, I'm going to hand it to Rayla to say anything you'd like to about our program year. One of the things I love about our UU program that makes my mother cringe is she says, I don't understand why your kids always have to have a say. Like, why do they always get an opinion? Why do they always, why do you always get, why do they always get to have a word? And I love that. Like, you know, we don't make any decisions about them without them, right? Um, our teachers that we have here are wonderful. Um, a lot of them have been doing this for a really long time. Um, we do have a few who are new this year including one who was voluntold this morning. <laughs> voluntold, I like that. <laughs> um, but this year, just like the um, congregation, most of our religious education classes are going to be also looking at world religions, although we won't necessarily be on the same religion that you all will be on, but we're going to kind of be doing the same program this year. Um, and then our senior youth will be doing um, coming of age, those who haven't done it last year. So we'd like to invite anyone who is teaching this year, volunteering this year, supporting this year, substituting this year to please come forward. Come on forward for this responsive reading. And the rest of you turn to the responsive reading in your order of service. As we bless this year's teachers, that includes Friday Friends. <laughs> Sometimes I call this a teacher commissioning. I titled it teacher ingathering, teacher installation, teacher blessing. All these things are words to say. This is an important start to our year. Ida, you could come up. You want to come up? Yeah. 
We come here today to install our teachers for this tri trimester and to celebrate the beginning of another year of learning together in our living tradition. As a learning community of all ages, we learn about and celebrate our Unitarian Universalist faith, world religions, and the work of social justice. We recognize the importance of each of you who volunteer in our religious education program, much like the lantern that carries the light of our chalice to Ari program. You are the light that guides our children and youth as the journey on their path of developing their Unitarian Universalist faith. We honor you for sharing your time and talents with our children and youth, knowing that their lives will be enriched by the time you spend with them. And parents, children, and youth join me in reading these words. We come today with trust and joy as our children and youth take their next steps on their religious education roadmap with you. Here, our children and youth will learn about our liberal religious heritage and about the ways we interact with the world with love and justice and compassion. We pledge to respect you, learn from you, and have fun with you. We know that we are also part of the teaching and learning community. And now our religious education teachers. We are grateful for the trust placed in us and the opportunity to share our passions, our faith, our heritage, and our living tradition with the next generation, encouraging wonder and bending the art of the universe for love and justice. And everyone. We value that we are a learning community together. We pledge to be teachers and learners along with you as we create this beloved community. In gratitude, trust, respect, and support, we, the members and friends of the First Parish Church of Stowe and Acton, install you as our religious education teachers for this trimester with great rejoicing. All right, Eve, do you want to come up? Oh, now I see you wanted the lantern, not the chalice, but you got to do both. That's great. All right, you all ready? Okay, Lily, Ida. And now this is our time for sharing what's on our hearts that we want to be known by the larger community. Ingrid Holcomb, our lay minister, is one of the people that you can turn to with deeper sorrows or questions or needs to talk and be in connection, or myself, and please email us if you'd like that. And Ingrid's gonna begin with sharing those that we've received online by email, if any. <laughs> yeah. Too many things to hold. Handle, phone, microphone. Let us hold all these joys and sorrows in our hearts, thinking upon them and the beloved members of this community as I share these words. Fall Equinox Meditation by Lori Gorgas Laban 
And before that, while we light a candle for those left unspoken and for the ongoing cost of war. Pause. Balanced in the center between the longest and shortest days. A gold leaf is held suspended by the delicate green needles on an evergreen tree. Equinox. The wheel of the year turns. Oh, you know what that was? I'm going to start over because that was like the little caption that they put under the pictures. And sometimes when I copy the text out of Worship Web, it gives me the caption under the pictures and I forget to delete it out. Apparently there was a lovely picture of a gold leaf held suspended by delicate green needles on an evergreen tree. Here we go. Pause. Balanced in the center between the longest and shortest days. Equinox. The wheel of the year turns and turns again. The air cools, days shorten, the sun seems to weaken, barely clearing the horizon after rising before beginning its descent. This is our opportunity now to pause, balanced, breathing in and breathing out, knowing this present moment, this present moment is all we're guaranteed, like the sun moving towards the shortest day, each moment arises and is gone before we know it. This is the time to pause and consider. As we enter the season of contemplation, of increasing darkness, of lying fallow, of dormancy, this is the season of letting go, of lightening burdens, of preparing for a long period of being still, going deep. Pause and consider. Binaries, dark and light, hot and cold, chaos and order. Neither extreme is inherently good or bad. It's all a matter of balance, of honoring the spectrum from which binaries mark the endpoints. Today, we mark the midpoint between summer and winter solstice, a time to seek balance and be free. Blessed be. Amen. Our next hymn is number 83, Winds Be Still. Please join in singing Rising in Body or Spirit.
the UU church I grew up in, I don't remember a lot of things about. I'm not one of those people who has strong memories of childhood moments much. But one thing I do remember about that church is that occasionally there would be a special service that children were included in, at least for the first part of the service, and that it had in it an apple and cheese communion. I don't remember when it was or what symbolism it was tied to, but for me, growing up UU meant sometimes, at special times, you ate apples in the church service. When I googled Apple Communion Week, and thanks to my worship committee members for helping here, I found that several UU churches have Apple Communions at different points in the year. I was surprised. I googled Apple Communion Unitarian, and all sorts of results popped up. Some have Apple Communions at Thanksgiving, some in October, and I agree that with all the German singing today, I think October might have been a good choice for this service. But for us, it will be the equinox. And what better time for an Apple Communion than as we kick off these annual apple pie sales? Our apple pie sales are a fundraiser, sure. But they are so much more than that, aren't they? Right? They represent generosity. The generosity of the orchard that donates fallen apples. The generosity of the time that the members of this community spend who come together to help. They represent community, the way community is built as we sit together and peel and slice and chop or make pie dough or bake or sell out at the pie shed. They represent autumn, harvest and blessing, fruits ripening and the leaves turning. The apple is symbolic. It represents good health, an apple a day. It represents an apple for the teacher, so knowledge and learning. It represents the sweetness of life. In the Passover Seder, they're used in a dish to represent the opposite of the horseradish, the sweetness of life. They represent good health, harvest, abundance, knowledge, love. So today, you are invited into an apple communion to celebrate, to celebrate the sweetness of life, the beauty of fall, our wishes for health and abundance for all of you, and most of all, gratitude and thanks for the work of this community and for apple pies, but most of all, for the blessings of this community itself. Thank you. Come, take a slice.
Those are Honeycrisp apples, which are one of my favorite varieties from Shelburne Farms, which is the orchard that donates their dropped apples to us for our apple pie sales every year. So we're grateful to them as well. Is Roy here? I know we want to have uh, an introduction to our plate sharing one of these weeks, so maybe we'll have that at the close of the month next week. Our plate is shared this month with the Interfaith Partnership for Resettling Refugees. And right now, as we hear rhetoric against refugees increasing in this country and violence increase in fear, both increasing proportionately to the rhetoric, what better time for us to dedicate ourselves to helping refugees, which we do through our plate sharing organization and through the work of our um, Supporting Asylum Seekers Task Force. And so please give generously, if you can, to this plate today, because no time has this been more needed than today. Thank you. So I wanted to introduce the anthem a little bit. Um, a very valid question is, why are you singing such depressing things? Um, and yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a valid question. And it's like, it's like already gray outside today. There's no sun. Do I have to think about these things? Um, and yeah, some, sometimes German leader can be just too depressing and it can be a little bit sort of glorifying and sort of overburdened and um, but also, I don't think that that's true of Schubert and Winterreise. This song cycle really talks about the human condition in parts of the human condition that we don't always want to talk about. And one of them is sort of mental health struggles. Um, I know that Schubert himself dealt with those, and he was really honest about the emotions around them in this music. And the song I'm going to sing next um, it, our wanderer is sleeping in a barn and he keeps getting woken up by the birds um, and having these sort of mid sort of sort of waking dreams of happier times um, and in I'm thinking about refugees when I'm singing this song because they're people who don't know where they're going to sleep tonight especially as you know we go into autumn as winter gets closer as the sun sets sooner and the nights are colder. Um, it's important to keep these people in mind and think about their condition. Ich schrie in die Röhren vom Tag, da war es 
The worship committee, when I asked them, what should I preach on for this Sunday in September that I don't have any topic assigned to yet, they suggested autumn poetry. Love it, because I have two degrees in English literature. I love poetry. Autumn is my favorite time of year. What better thing to preach on? So as I'm reading poem after poem after poem about autumn, going pulling all my old volumes off my shelves, googling autumn poetry where all the answers are Keats and um, Emily Dickinson. I'm remembering back to a conversation I had at a party in January of 1993. It was a New Year's party, that's why I remember when it was, and it was this year that I spent in between, or 93 or 94, but anyway, a year I spent living in between uh, undergraduate and graduate school living in Georgia. And I was at a young adult party of the young adult group of the UU Church. And I am wearing all black, something I never do anymore. And um, I'm wearing a black tank top and a black mesh shirt over it and a big um, Egyptian Ankh necklace because I'm trying to look like death from Neil Gaiman's Sandman 
right? Um, and I'm talking to this uh, graduate student in psychology uh, who's kind of hitting on me. And he's leaning in and he says to me about psychology and poetry and the world, and he says, it's all about sex and death. Well, as I'm reading autumn poem after autumn poem after autumn poem, I'm like, it is all about sex and death. I mean, it's the falling leaves and the turning of the year into the coldness of winter, death, and then it's about the ripe, lush fruit falling from the tree, and that's all about sex. But what is more religious, really, to talk about than sex and death? I mean, death is obviously religious, right? When we think about death, we think about is there a hereafter? What is the nature of God? Is there a God? And sex? Oh yes, also a very religious topic. Too often a topic in a negative way as the church tries to regulate sex and sexuality, telling us not to have sex outside of marriage or not to masturbate, yes I said it, not to have sex with someone of the opposite sex. But in the liberal church, church can also be about sex, right? Teaching healthy sexuality as we do with the Our Whole Lives curriculum where we teach every other year um, to our youth and now hopefully is teaching soon to younger ages as well. Holding up all sexual orientations in our faith as being between consenting adults as being whole and holy and worthy and even celebrating pleasure at love and the combination of all these things. Wedding services are done in religious communities celebrating the coming together of two people. And while we don't always talk about sex in them, it's there from the breaking of the glass, which is the hymen um, in Jewish ceremonies, to uh, tossing garters at the reception to all the flowers. And don't get me started thinking about flowers. And so with that in mind, I decided after reading a dozen poems about fall to focus on the ones about apples. <laughs> Since apples are a symbol for us in the fall with our apple pie sales, and what I found were four poems about apples that I absolutely enjoyed that range from being about sex to being also about death. I thought apples would be all sex and no death, but no, Robert Frost can make anything about death <laughs> from stopping by the woods on a snowy evening to apple gathering. But let's start with the more fruity, shall we? And we'll get to Frost. This is an apple gathering by, of all poets, Christina Rossetti. If you've ever read her Goblin Market, you'll see the lushness of fruits throughout that. She writes, I, puck, I plucked pink blossoms from mine apple tree and wore them that evening in my hair. And then in due season when I went to sea, I found no apples there. With dangling basket all along the grass as as I had come, I went the self-same track. My neighbors mocked me when they saw me pass, so empty-handed back. Lillian and Lilia smiled and trudging by. Their heaped-up basket teased me like a jeer. Sweet-voiced they sang through the sunset sky. Their mother's home was near. Plump Gertrude passed me with her basket full. A stronger hand than hers helped it along. A voice talked with her through the shadows cool, more sweet to me than song. Ah, willy willy, was my love less worth than apples with their green leaves piled above? I counted rosiest apples of the earth of far less worth than love. So once it was with me you stooped to talk, laughing and listening in this very lane, to think that by the way we used to walk, we shall not walk again. I let me neighbors pass me ones and twos, and groups the latest said the night grew chill, and hastened, but I loitered while the dews fell fast, I loitered still. Now, it's probably just a coincidence that the man who did poor Christina narrators wrong was named Willie. The Oxford English Dictionary only dates the name Willie used as a body part back to 1905. And Rossetti is writing this in 1862. Yes, I, I had to Google that. <laughs> On the other hand, if you've ever read Christina Rossetti's Goblin Market, you know she's throwing sexual imagery in all over the place. So here is a girl who plucks flowers 
for a certain special evening event with Willie. She is literally deflowered and probably metaphorically so as well. And her tree deflowered bears no fruit. Then she finds come fall that the man has done her wrong and is picking apples with another girl, the rosiest apples. Picking apples is definitely sex. She thought it was of less worth than love, but apparently not so to Willie. What's the point? Why do I share this in worship? The poem is about trust. It's about consent. It's about sexual double standards. It's about love and abandonment, human themes we can all relate to, parts of the human experience. Does it rise above human experience to the level of religious? Maybe not. But the good news is that apples have a lot more to tell us in this fall. This is Der Apfel Garden, The Apple Orchard, by Rainer Maria Rilke. Come right after the sun goes down and see the evening greenness of the fields of grass. Isn't it just as if we had amassed and saved it up inside us gradually? So that from feeling now and memories, from recent hope and half-recalled delight, still mixed with darkness from inside, we might strew it in thoughts before us under trees, like those of Dürer bearing the encumbrance of a hundred days of labor in the fruit that overfills them, serving full of patience, attempting to experience how that which goes beyond all measurements is still to be raised up and offered in sacrifice when we, through a long life, with all our will, want just one thing and grow and hold the peace. Now, when Rilke mentions woodcuts by Dürer, we should think about the fact that Dürer made mostly religious woodcuts, and while many featured trees, notably the one that featured an apple tree would be a woodcut, a famous woodcut of, Ap of Adam and Eve. So when Rilke is talking about half-recalled the lights under trees like Dürer, He's also talking about sex. Because when Eve eats that apple and passes that apple to Adam, the first thing they realize with the knowledge they gain is that they are naked. Eating apples provides knowledge of sexuality. That is the forbidden fruit. This is biblical, ergo it is religious. <laughs> But Rilke goes beyond that sexual illusion into something more complicated. That whole poem is just one sentence mulling over thoughts. Thoughts about this complicated feeling of memory and hope and delight, but mixed with darkness. What Rilke is pointing to, but doesn't quite give us, doesn't quite make the answer easy to grasp, I think Mary Oliver gives us more plainly. This is The Orchard by Mary Oliver. I have dreamt of accomplishment. I have fed ambition. I have traded nights of sleep for a length of work. Lo, and I have discovered how soft bloom turns to green fruit, which turns to sweet fruit. And lo, I have discovered all winds blow cold at last, and the leaves so pretty, so many, vanish in the great black packet of time packet of ambition, and the ripeness of the apple is its downfall. There you have it. The apple ripens and it falls, as does all life, right? We reach that peak, that pinnacle, and then it's all downhill from there. So many of us feel that. I know it's something I dwell upon now that I'm an empty nester. My fertile days behind me. Have I gone past the best of life now that my child has grown and gone? Maybe yes, in that area of life, which is not to say there isn't more to live for, but that ambition, that accomplishment, the ripeness of the apple in that part of my life is more or less behind me. Maybe not totally, maybe not professionally, but the ambition of motherhood and the accomplishment of those years are more or less ended. Whether you feel that way yet in your life, in any part of your life about something that was your pinnacle that's behind you, Mary Oliver is right in that all winds eventually blow cold and all leaves fall at last. So, of course, that brings us to Robert Frost. Nature's first green is gold, right? This is After Apple Picking by Robert Frost. 
my long two-pointed ladders sticking through a tree towards heaven still. And there's a barrel I didn't fill beside it, and there maybe two or three apples I didn't pick upon some bough. But I am done with apple picking now. Essence of winter, sleep is on the night. The scent of apples, I'm drowsing off. I cannot rub the strangeness from my sight. I got through looking through a pane of glass. I skimmed this morning from the drinking trough and held against the world of hoary grass. It melted and I let it fall and break, but I was well upon my way to sleep before it fell. And I could tell what form my dreaming was about to take. Magnified, magnified apples appear and disappear stem end and blossom end, every fleck of russet showing clear. My instep arch not only keeps the ache, it keeps the pressure of a ladder round. I feel the ladder sway as the boughs bend. I keep hearing from the cellar bend the rumbling sound of load on load of apples coming in. For I have had too much of apple picking. I am overtired of the great harvest I myself desired. There were 10,000 thousand fruit to touch, cherish in hand, lift down and not let fall for all that struck the earth. No matter if not bruised or spiked with stubble, went surely to the cider apple heap as of no worth. One can see what one will trouble, this sleep of mine, whatever sleep it is, were he not gone, the woodchuck could say whether it's like his long sleep as I describe it coming on or just some human sleep. So there you go. Robert Frost, not just from the woods and snow, can make you think of death, but also apple picking. And what we see from the symbol of the apple is that it's deeply religious. From Eve to now, from the blossom and the deflowering of the tree to the ripe fruit to the seeds left when you're done. It carries within the apple the lifespan, the birth, the ripening, the death. It carries the sweetness and the tartness and the sometimes rotten dying bits. Altogether, it is the apple of our year, our now, our past, our future. So as we go into our apple-laden fall and we buy our apple pies and we make our apple pies, I invite you to reflect upon this autumn time as the wheel of the year turning, turning in the cycle of life, the cycle of birth and sex and death, the cycle of light and dark, as we stand now at this equinox upon this balancing point and turn once more into the turning of the year. Our closing hymn today is number 52, In Sweet Fields of Autumn.
what will you do with your one wild and precious life this autumn? Go and bless the world with peace and love and justice. Blessed be. Amen. Thank you.